All right, hey everybody, and welcome to Chew Stream. Really happy to have my one of my best buddies in the whole freaking planet of Earth, uh, Thierry Lafontaine, on the stream. Say hey, hi, Bobby. Hey, uh, how's it going there in uh, Saint Julien? It's going great. It's uh, it's beautiful here. Got up early, watch a beautiful. Uh, the sun rising, it was purple and pink. Oh, watch man. that with the students, it was awesome. Love it, I love it. Uh, yeah. yeah, for those of you that don't know Thierry Lafontaine, he is the mentor that uh, runs the Imaginism house out in uh, Saint Julien, just outside of Montreal. Um, it's the most intensive, most serene, most peaceful thing that we do in schoolism which kind of makes no sense but if you're there then you would totally understand what i'm talking <laughs> about it's a lake house it's a beautiful lake house and it is literally one of the most positive my favorite things um that we do so this is going to be a treat as well um t you know i asked you yesterday to paint something so that it's not just me painting all the time. This painting that you're watching is actually a uh, tea painting today. So uh, thank you, T, for doing this for me. Um, oh, you're it's welcome. Gonna be awesome. It's going to be awesome. And I can't wait to do this again with actually Nathan Fawkes. I asked him to join me on the stream uh, where he's going to be painting instead of me. And uh, I'm very excited to see that as well. Awesome. Thank you for asking me, Bobby. It was uh, a new challenge. And uh, one of the things I want to do this year in this new 2016 year is try new things. Right on. Yeah, I was just about to ask you, you know, because it's the new year and everything. Do you are you the type of person to have uh, <coughs> a goal for the year and like, you know, um, New Year's resolutions? Yes, um, I got a few goals for this year. Um, I love to work on children's book. I'd like to do more illustration for a children's book. Also, I love doing covers for a children's book. So I want to do that. And I have this thing that um, most of the jobs that I, I got um, was things I wanted to do. And I just started doing it by myself, kind of fake stuff. And then it happened to uh, to turn into clients asking me to do the exact same thing. For example, the last children's books I worked on, uh, I was doing Stephen Silver's class on cool schoolism, his uh, character design class. And I was thinking, I want to do children's book in that particular style. And I did a bunch of characters for his class in that style. And then... I've been asked right after to uh, submit samples for a children's book, and now I got a five book deal uh, from that. So I'd like to do more covers. I was thinking I would do some fake covers, like choose books. I'd love to do the cover and just do image for it and post it, and hopefully that will attract other stuff. Also. Um, I'd love to work on my own children's book. I got a few ideas that I'd like to uh, get done. And that, that's for my goals. That's for my goals. Uh, resolution. Um, one thing, there's some re resolution I'd like to keep going. For example, um, I read, I don't know if I read that with you, but it was definitely when I was in Toronto. I don't know if it was a tech TED Talk or some ebooks we were listening, but there was someone saying that you should put 10% of your annual income towards your education and to get better at what you're doing. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was that was me saying that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, you're you're part of my inspiration and I consider you as those TED Talks and those inspirational books that we nice. read. I'm, I'm an audio book inside <laughs> a person. <laughs> yeah, you're a li living audio book. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I just want to emphasize to everybody because uh, that first thing that you're saying to kind of 
start just kind of pretending working on your dream project, right? Yeah. That is something that we have in common, and that's something that we've kind of uh, even developed together, you know, back when you were living in Toronto. Mm-hmm when we had no jobs the rule is you got to work twice as hard right on yep. your, on your, the jobs that you would love to have so it's really great to hear like um that y you know you've embraced that it's, it's so awesome um now so children's books you want to do children's books you you have a goal for the year or you have a goal for six months or do you have a goal for like or all of those you know, like multiple uh, goals for different time periods? Uh, well, short-term goal would be to do some fake covers. I'm working on some children's book at the same time, so... No, no, I mean, uh, like, do you... So I have, you know, goals for the next six months, and then a year, and then five years from now, and then one for, like, ten years from now. I was thinking more for the year. Okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> Year goes so fast. We yeah, have, totally. it's unbelievable. Um, we have so much fun here at the Imaginism Workshop. When the students arrive, I tell them, first thing you're going to notice is that one week is gone. Second thing, we're going to be halfway, and then you won't see the tree fort. It's going to be, oh, my God, there's one day left. And I feel every month goes like that, and that year's go by so fast well you know what uh same thing at our like here in toronto right like the days go by so fast do you do you feel the same way Masay? yeah i mean it's been my third month but i feel like i've been here for a year already oh really yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like things like that and but... i feel like you've been here for a year already <laughs> as well you know like yeah time really flies when you're having fun obviously yeah <laughs> and i i find like time really flies when you're doing stuff yeah right when you're getting stuff done and especially if there's evolution which is why you know like um people with kids they see their kids evolve like you know so quick especially yeah. in the very beginning and then those are the people that generally will say way more like wow time really flies <laughs> right because they're constantly reminded because there's constant change in their lives. But mm -hmm. if your life is not progressing and your career is not progressing, then you feel like every day takes way longer. You know, every day you're looking at the clock. So that's kind of like a, I think that's kind of like a test for yourself because I know when I was working in a television studio, I would just stare at that clock and just go, <laughs> is that thing going backwards or something? Like what's going on? <laughs> Yeah, so that I think that's a good test for everybody out there. If you, if every day dribbles along so slow, um, you know, you're that not you're, probably you're not... not heading in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, anyways, um, people are asking their questions, so let's get to some of them. So the first question is from Mark. Mark says, is one of your goals finally getting a dog? And I, I guess this one's going to you because I, I feel like <laughs> that's a key question. Everyone is asking me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, in a couple weeks, we're having the incredible, the amazing Justin Fields, Justin Gobi Fields to uh, the Imaginism House. And yes, is he bringing his dog? I don't know. I think he asked me if he could, and I said yes. Yeah, so that's going to be really fun. He has a big, super friendly, just like <laughs> the friendliest uh, pit bull <laughs> that I've ever met. You know, it's just like, uh, I hope he does, because that it's, it's so... It's so great to have dogs around. I don't know. I'm a dog mm -hmm. person. <laughs> I love dogs as well. And um, you're a cat person? Are you a cat person, T? I'm really allergic to cats. <laughs> <laughs> like, terribly allergic. Last time I pet a cat, my eyeballs, the white of my eyeballs started swelling, and it was dripping out of my eye, oh. and I thought I would be blind. Oh, jeez. <laughs> all right, all right. 
Uh, so no cap for me. Okay. But oddly, uh, uh, well, I've you been know what? drawing cats lately. <laughs> you know what though? That's funny because um, for a while I was drawing a lot of bunnies, a lot of rabbits, <laughs> right? And for I didn't know why. I didn't even think about it. And then I realized that I started drawing rabbits after uh, my brother Ben, his rabbit, tried to bite me. <laughs> you know, and then I would draw all these rabbits all the time. And they were mean, your rabbits. Uh, no, actually, <laughs> it was all these paintings of rabbits in uh, serious danger <laughs> from getting <laughs> eaten or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, so very subconscious it's interesting after a while you look at your paintings and you're like where did this come from subconsciously right yeah i have the perfect place for having a dog it would be really happy here yeah oh yeah of course well the the house is a big house and there's water in the back there's a lake in the back it's a lake house um so let's go to the next question this one's from jenna she asks uh how do you approach or find work in cover art where do you look online? So I guess I'll let you <laughs> take this one. You touched on this a bit. You know, you got to, when you don't have work, just pretend you do and just start doing it. Do exactly. it seriously. Exactly. I feel, you know, it's a little bit like the law of attraction. I feel don't wait for people to um, tell you you can be what you want to be. Uh, my trick well, I'm lucky enough to be part of Imaginism Studios, and like, it's a great to it's great to be with a bunch of amazing artists like you guys. And like people, they ask us to do work for them, and but I find often you kind of provoke that, or you know, there's some saying that says meet opportunity halfway or something like that. So. For me to meet that halfway is like, I pretend I do the work that I want. If I want to do children's book, I'll do a bunch of illustration of children, like stuff that I would see in a children's book, and I post it. And usually right after, um, I get people asking me to do that, to do more covers. I'll, I would do, like, I'm, I'm going to do that soon. I'm going to find books that I would love to do the cover for, whether it's Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, and do my version of it and pretend it's a real cover. Pretend I did a cover for it, post it. Because people, they want to see what you can do and that you can deliver. So if they go on your website and see you did 20 covers for books, they don't care if it's real covers or not. You know what I mean? They see what they can get for you and how. And I feel that's doing your part of creating an opportunity and meeting people halfway. So that's how I would approach doing that. Also, there's New York Comic Con that is great. There's a lot of book publisher there. So if you, have, if you get a table or an artist alley, um, there's going to be tons of book publisher walking around looking for illustrator to do their book. Right on. I, I won't even answer that one myself. Uh, that, that's pretty much uh, everything that I would say. Um, let's go on to the next question. The next question comes from Calvin. Calvin asks, when do you guys plan to bring uh, Schoolism Live to Brazil? One of my favorite <laughs> places in the whole world. And uh, T, you were born in Brazil. And yes. so it has a very close place to all of our hearts. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure at this point you know brazil is harder to organize uh we were you know i've been to florianopolis rio a few times sao paulo a few times um the next time i hope i hope we can fit it in next year uh but no promises um but you know i do promise to do my best uh, <laughs> yeah i love 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 uh the people in brazil um a lot of friends in brazil as well so you know i would love to go back and you should come next time t i would love to exactly exactly uh you know you've 
you were born there, but you've you don't have any memories of Brazil. No, right? um, I'm adopted. My parents are from Quebec. And I was adopted from Brazil when I was two weeks old. And it's a crazy story. Let, let, you want to tell it? I'll, I'll try to tell a little version of it. Um, my parents were looking for uh, a kid to adopt. And my mom found a little girl, but she felt it wasn't the right person. And when I was born, um, I think it was a girl that was 17 years old. And I think her dad was a university teacher. Oh, wow. I know, sorry. Her, her, my dad was a university teacher, and I think her, the my mom's dad was a politician. And the mentality in the time I was born in Brazil was kind of like here in the 50s. So it was really badly seen. So they they couldn't keep the baby. Wait, so you're saying your your biological mom, you, you think she was a teacher? No, she was a 17 years old daughter from a politician. In oh, Brazil. wow, that sounds like a movie, man. Yeah, it was a scandal. Wow. And I think my dad was a university teacher or something like that. So they couldn't keep the baby for a bunch of reasons. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't my aunt was working at the Kenyan Indian embassy in Brazil so okay. she knew Portuguese and she knew around and she had a friend that was a lawyer and back then the mentality was really back uh, so her husband was a politician as well and he didn't want her to work so she was volunteering in a place a place where women could go if they had uh, issues like um, with their husband and stuff like that. And she met that my mom, my biological mom there. And But you couldn't take a baby out of the country and adopt it if he had known parents. Uh -huh. So they had to kind of leave me under a tree. What? <laughs> <laughs> but it was kind of arranged. My mom had to kind of leave me under the tree and someone had to find me. And a guy, like a friend of my aunt, had to go to court and swear that he found me under a tree and yeah. that they didn't know who my biological parents were. Okay. And then I could be adopted. Wow. But I'll, also I was sick. I had to get an operation on my heart when I was like one week old. What? Yeah. Wow. Uh, they, they had to go through my mouth, actually, because no one wanted to operate the baby. Oh, wow. And uh, my aunt had some kind of uh, maid that kind of was a witch, and she was uh, some kind of shaman witch, and she was giving me a bunch of weird potion. And uh, they found a doctor that wanted to, that was okay. I would have died before I was two weeks old, and I got this operation on my heart through my mouth. And also, uh, my mom had to go to court to ask the judge if she could take me out of the country. Uh -huh. And she couldn't. All the judge were saying no. And one day, my mom went in some kind of a flea market, and she found a bunch of rings that she liked. And the last time she went to court, uh, she was wearing one of the ring, and she didn't know, but it was some kind of a secret society ring. Kind of, I think it was the Rosy Crushens, the Rose Cross. Oh. And then it happened that the judge was a woman and she was in that secret society. They and both she, had the same ring on. Yeah. <laughs> and she thought my mom was in as well. And my mom had no idea what she was talking about. But she kind of signed all the papers and she came to the airport custom with us to make sure we could go out of the country. The judge. Yeah. Unbelievable. So that's my first two weeks of my life. Wow. Wow. That's like epic, a real movie right epic. there. <laughs> that was so we good. We should write it. <laughs> you know what's great about that is like, um, you know, if, if all of that is true, which, you know, I have no doubt that it wouldn't be true or whatever, <laughs> but like um, you came from good genes. 
<laughs> right? That's really good. You know, because a lot of, um, you know, when you want to adopt and things like that, a lot of times, you know, there are kids that, you know, their their parents were drug addicts and things like that, and that's why they can't mm-hmm. take care of their kids. But, you, you know, hopefully you came from a family that was in politics and then a teacher. That's pretty <laughs> darn good, man. <laughs> and it's it's amazing to me all these people that did all these things for me when I was just, you know, two weeks, one week old, you know what I mean? Mm. All these people that love you and you just came into the world, you don't even know nothing. Totally. And I have a brother that was adopted in Colombia. Yes. And he just got a little girl. She's, you know, when you say time goes fast, she's two years old now. She's amazing. I spend so much time playing with her. It's amazing. <laughs> She's funny. You guys, uh, I'll try to get her here when you guys come. Yeah, yeah. I met her before. Oh, super, super, super cute. cute. At uh, two years old, they're awesome. <laughs> Just keep pushing down her head every time you see her so she doesn't grow, all right? Uh, <laughs> so let's go on to the next question here. This one's from Marks. Marks everywhere. He asks, uh, how can I develop my own digital painting style without getting caught up in trying to copy my favorite artist and getting addicted to the latest tutorial? Which is, I think, kind of like an epidemic that's happening in the art community nowadays where they just find a custom brush, they find a couple of techniques, and then all of a sudden their stuff looks kind of sort of good but doesn't have any foundational, mm-hmm. you know, strong, strong fundamentals. Maybe you want to take this one, T? Sure, sure, yeah. I would say don't just study one artist study a whole bunch of artists uh, you know uh there's a bunch of artists that i love like i i learned to render stuff from from you bobby um i love how doug sneet draws the mouths and the um, profile of the girls um case stuff is amazing too i like Doug Sneed, cute... he is uh one of like the master illustrators uh yeah, for playboy for, over for playboy. Many, many decades and k is k Asadera, uh character designer extraordinaire as well as uh you know part owner of the studio yeah k is the cute i like how um sensitive and appealing k stuff is um there's you know nathan folks i love nathan folks i study his stuff uh for the colors and the composition i like uh so what you're saying is you're pretty much frankenstein Uh, yeah and i think that's the trick to study artists and not have your stuff look like one of them because this way you take what you like from all these artists and that makes kind of your style well, it's definitely really cool seeing uh, your career develop because it's like there's parts. And if you look, if you know everybody kind of looks into your art and looks back into time, there's almost parts where stuff all of a sudden just changes within like a week or two to completely different um, aesthetic look or style. Uh, you know, you're a person that constantly experiments with different things, which I, I've think it's really great Uh, you know most of one thing i try to do is to at least once a month learn something that totally blows my mind and totally change the way i do things right on so okay don't want to put you on the spot but what are you learning now what's your uh right now i'm gonna i just learn i'm doing oil painting uh, we got John Hardesty that you uh, talked to on the stream uh, not too long ago. Mm-hmm. He came here and introduced me to oil painting. And the last thing uh, that blew my mind was he was telling me, uh, think of things in terms of brushstroke. See, like, see things in terms of brushstroke instead of in terms of transition and value and stuff like that. And that's the last thing that totally blew my mind. I love, and, uh, I love how it's just one sentence. And when you told yeah. me that, I was thinking about that for like the next week as well. You know, it's just like, 
what does this look like as a brush stroke? And it really helps with uh, like a la prima kind of stuff when you're just you're painting a landscape or something like that, like painting from observation. Yeah, and when he tell when he told me that, it's like someone turned on a light switch. You're like, oh my god, that makes so much sense. Why did I think of that before? Oh, very cool. Well, hopefully we could turn on a lot of light switches uh, for everybody here on the stream today. A lot of really good uh, info and answers. Let's go on to the next question here, which is, um, let's see. So the next question goes, this one's from Fluff. And Fluff says, <laughs> I recently bought a year subscription. What classes would you recommend for someone that is interested in illustration and traditional painting? Also, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? Interesting. <laughs> okay, so um, what classes would I recommend? It, if you are coming straight from you know, the beginning, then I would do something fundamental, like uh, fundamentals of character design, fundamentals of lighting, fundamentals of uh, drawing, like drawing fundamentals with Thomas Flaherty. Um, those are all really great things to begin with. Also, intro to digital paint. It depends on what kind of uh, illustration you want to do. Of course, I just realized you said that uh, you're interested in traditional, traditional as well. Traditional. So definitely John Hardesty. That should be a must um, if you're interested in painting. As well as, of course, the heavyweights, uh, Daisatsumi, Robert Kondo, when you're ready to t tackle them. Uh, Nathan Fawkes, those are all super good painting classes. And the thing about them is that it talks about, you know, it really gets the core of the things that you want to learn, which is how to see life and how to uh, break it up and stylize it and, you know, just have full control over it. So uh, even though a lot of the work is done digitally with the students and everything, that's only because of time restraints, right? They don't focus, like their main focus is definitely not digital painting techniques. Actually, that's my course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so take every course except for my course, I guess. That would be the best uh, advice. And let's go on to the next question because there's actually a lot or I don't know if you want to add anything to that, T? Um, you know, uh, there's Sam Nielsen's class also that oh, really yes, yes, yes. you learned so much about light. Uh, that was a big uh, turn in my career. You remember when I did this class, Bobby? Yeah, your stuff looked completely different after. Yeah, so that that's uh, one I would add in, in that. You know, they're all great. <laughs> They all great, and I feel they all add a lot of stuff into. They all, they're all eye opening and really change. Almost like I did almost all the classes, and they all totally change the way I draw and paint, and they still do. Right on. Right. Well, these well, questions are really piling I'm, in, so let's go to the next okay. one here. So. And by the way, there are tons and tons of ex uh, in house workshop artists on the stream right now from Ismini to oh. uh, Mara, Mika Madden, uh, Flavio, I saw on there, Ykit, and a whole bunch of others. So, um, hey guys, uh, thanks for dropping in. They all miss you. They're all saying, oh, it's so <laughs> nice to hear your voice again, this and that. Um, okay, so next question says. Oh, so last question with that question was, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? I don't eat ice cream. I'm allergic to lactose. <laughs> so maybe you can answer this one, T. Mine is mint with chocolate chips. Right on. And when I could eat ice cream, my favorite flavor was Jamocha Almond Fudge. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So good. All right. So um, next question here is, uh, do you think it's, this one's from Claudel. Uh, this person asks, do you think it's a good way to work using a Wacom tab tablet uh, plugged into a Cintiq? I would like your opinion on this one because like you, I like the Cintiq, but I don't, wanna, I don't want arm problems to develop. Well, um, I think you, you can totally use 
a nice big Cintiq forever and ever and not have arm problems. Like mine really began because I just didn't, I tried to stay in my chair. I tried not to take any breaks at all. I tried to always muscle through everything and it's just constant grinding and um, not recommended. You know, take constant short breaks and that's that's good enough. Uh, but yeah, generally, ergonomically, you want your the position of your arm to be like an L shape where your forearm is parallel to the ground and uh, your upper arm is perpendicular to the ground ground just like uh, the right posture for say keyboarding right like typing uh, that's the same kind of thing there so let's go on to the next question if that's cool um, Anna writes I'm gonna take three 10 week courses abroad starting in February right on I was wondering what you guys think is the best way to make the most of courses and classes in general. So this one is a great one because um, it's something that I don't know if we ever talked about it. You know, for myself, you know, at work, uh, I have scheduled time slots where I'm not supposed to do anything else except for do classes, you know, and learn. Right, and that's today in the afternoon. Um, you should do the same thing. That's what I think. Uh, that's what helps the most. So don't make it a loose schedule. You know, make it a rigid schedule, a tight schedule where you are not going to do. You're not going to let anything get in the way. You know, if it's a family function, stuff like that, they need to uh, reschedule. <laughs> you know, just pretend it's like a doctor's appointment. Uh, and that really is the key to, um, for me anyways, doing well on. What about you, T? You've done a bunch of classes. I find um, you got to go there with an open mind. Like um, when I do a class, um, you know, sometimes I have my way of doing things and someone in a class approach uh, with another way. Um, I find the best thing for me to learn stuff is to just go there with an open mind and try what people teach me their own way and just give it a try and try to understand why they do it like this and like not stick to my old way but just be open to take some new ways new information and stuff like that and after the class you know, maybe you adopt this way, maybe you don't, maybe it becomes a mix with the way you already used to do things. But I feel if you don't want to try new things, then you kind of block stuff and you're going to paint the same way yeah. you do after the class. So I find it's to trust your teacher and just go there with an open mind, let them do their thing, follow their program and see where it takes you. That's so good, you know, like open mind, open opportunities. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that? Yeah, sure. So I'm actually taking, um, what I found that's really helpful is after you get your critique video, um, I think it's really important to actually redo the assignment because yeah, uh, someone can tell you what to do, but it's like until you do it, you won't understand like what they're trying to tell you. And Very true. Um, yeah, so what I'm taking right now is Daniel Ariaga's character design class, and he literally sketches over your drawing. So what I do is I start with a new sheet, follow what he's doing, and see how he's thinking of like, like what his what his thought process is while he's you know drawing over my stuff. And also, I found it helpful to look at other students' critique and see what he comments on those ones. So it's like see what other what he would say about other like. Um, problem people might encounter so things like that I mean it's that's like, really great yeah really I mean great. if you're taking it and you're having all this like resources might as well you know take advantage of that and make the most out of it that's that's what I think oh, totally I generally I'll watch the lesson and then I'll watch at least at least four critiques before I start doing my assignment mm -hmm. you know because a lot of times people will have the exact same problems um, and you just 
probably just didn't realize. And the other thing is totally right. Like when you do the assignments um, and then you get the feedback, do the feedback on your own assignment because there's so many things that you, it's hard to learn just verbally somebody telling you. Uh, it's, there's kind of like a different learning that happens when you're actually doing it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's great answers. Now, um, before we get to the next question here, <laughs> you know, this, uh, this painting of yours went from a landscape to all of a sudden uh, a mysterious trippy cat thing coming out. So what <laughs> what is the uh, idea behind this lovely painting of yours? Um, you know, uh, I like to do a lot of uh, studies from life and from pictures and I'm trying there to mix uh, both try to do add stuff from imagination into uh, more uh, stuff more like studies mm -hmm. and um, it just one day here the landscape are beautiful almost every day I see some beautiful stuff and I take picture and the other day I was driving around and I saw there was fog everywhere and the roads were amazing and I took a bunch of pictures and that's what inspired me to do this painting and it was all like foggy and overcast and it was all grayish and I thought it'd be beautiful to have something uh, colorful in there. Mm -hmm. Which that cat looks very colorful but if I color pick on it, it's like 10% saturation. It's all gray, but it's just so gray around. So I wanted uh, something to contrast that would pop out. So the size of the cat is a contrast, the color of it, the saturation. Mm -hmm. And this is like, um, the, like the cat has a lot of different hues in it, right? Yes. Now, is that done in uh, your brush settings to make huge jitter? Wow. Um, no, actually, um, if you rewatch the video, you could probably see what I do. I just use a normal round brush in Photoshop at 50% opacity, 10% flow. I took a fluorescent, fluorescent, well, really bright saturated green and I dab a little bit. I drew the silhouette of the cat in white and then I take a really bright green, dab a little bit in there. And then I took a really bright blue, dab a little bit in there, really bright pink, dab a little bit. And then I crank, I use, crank the saturation up and then uh, it looked like that. Got it. And a big shout out to Jonathan Hardesty, he just joined us on the stream. Big oh, hi John. Him. Right hey. on. Artist extraordinaire, definitely worth uh, looking him up and checking out his art. And yeah. of course, we were talking earlier, and uh, John's class, Essentials of Realism, is um, is starting February first, and that is like one of those critique classes where you sign up, and John actually paints on top of your assignments after you hand them in. So, for those of you that are, you know, don't feel like you quite know what the heck you're looking at all your life like how does reality work where are these colors and tones and light and all that stuff coming from this is a highly recommended class for you guys uh absolutely transformational let's go on to the next question here um so next question says Ben says, uh, hey T, Bobby, uh, any plans to do an in-house workshop for those who have already done the in-house workshop, like a workshop 2.0? <laughs> <laughs> I, I plan on doing this. Um, it would be more about painting, a lot of painting. And I was thinking it could be kind of a, more of a project where we will work on a project. We would be making a book or making a gallery show at the end of the workshop. That's what I'm thinking right now. But uh, there's a lot of people that ask me for a part two. 
And um, it's definitely harder than it seems to schedule in a part two, right? Yes. Like I'm trying to get T to just leave the house every once in a while and come hang out with us, like you know, go on some trips and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, that part two that would be super cool. But, yeah, I think I could do one once in a while, you know. Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. That'd be awesome. Let's go on to the next question here. So the next question says, uh, Jenna says, let's see. Yeah, Jenna says, what other sites besides the obvious social media, Instagram, Facebook, etc., and DeviantArt are good places to be posting my art? I don't feel like I have a strong network. Well, um, ArtStation. ArtStation is mm -hmm. like, I really feel like they're the place that all the art directors and a lot of people, uh, people that are really good at art hang out um anything that i missed t um Do you... there's a cg society yes yeah, cg society that's a good one too a little bit more towards the 3d realm mm -hmm. of things there's or, definitely an aesthetic yeah. to their site or 2d sci-fi things could have a, a place in there as well um, DeviantArt, do you, did she name DeviantArt? Yes. Yeah. That's a big one. If you check uh, what, like, it's ranking on the internet, it's really impressive. Oh, yeah. It's, like, number 100 or something in the yeah. world. In the world. It's like, unbelievable. to everything. Yahoo.com, everything. Yeah, um, that's a very impressive. Yes, for sure. Uh, let's go on to the next question because there's just a ton of questions um i teach animation to some people this is the question and so far the biggest problem is their lack of confidence and scared uh of doing or sorry and scare of don't do things right okay so let me just rephrase that a tiny bit I teach animation and sometimes the biggest problem is uh the student's confidence and uh their fear of not doing things right how could i help them uh beyond the whole you can do it um you know i'm sure we all have really good uh advice for this uh if you don't mind i'll just start you know go for it one is what are you what are you measuring you know success uh by you know is it to paint an awesome painting? Is it to try hard? You know, think about that and think about what are the things that you w could have total control over? Um, this is something that I've kind of talked about a bunch of times, but sometimes you gotta just talk about a few more times to get everybody uh, to understand. You know, to paint a good painting, is that in your control? No, that's not in your control. Uh, is trying as hard as you can in in your control yes everybody can try as hard as they can right and if that is your idea of success will that lead you to a successful art career yeah yeah it actually would right because people that put in a hundred percent effort you know are are very rare and generally uh how you're going to do an art, the talent that you develop, it's developed. It's not born with it. You know, you put in the time with logic, with logical common sense, uh, people will notice and you'll do really great. Um, so one is to tell your students, hey, change your idea of of like w what your objective is it shouldn't be to paint a great painting it should be trying your hardest to learn and uh, trying to constantly use logical thinking am I going in the right direction or am I just painting like I saw this monk one time I don't want to like go on a tangent too much but <laughs> I saw this w uh, this monk one time uh, on TV I don't know if you remember this T but this monk paints a self-portrait of himself every day for years and years and years and he has this room just full 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 of self-portraits and they all look the bloody same you know they all look the same so that is kind of like my 
uh, example of if your goal is to improve, which I don't know if this monk's goal was to improve or not, you got to use logical thinking because if you just paint the same painting, you know, do the same thing every day, even though you're trying super hard, you're going in the wrong direction. Right? Mm -hmm. like that's your goal. So that's number one. And uh, anything you want to add to that, T? Yes. Uh, it seems like your students are scared to fail. So I don't think uh, what you need to change is failing because I think successful people fail a lot more than unsuccessful people. Unsuccessful people, they try to draw something. They're not good at it, and they're like, I'm not good at this. That's not for me. I'm going to do something else. Successful people, they we all drawn bad before, and we all do bad drawings. I read somewhere you need to do 10,000 bad drawings before you do a good one. So successful artists probably fell 10,000 times at least. You know what I mean? So I, I think what you need to do is not change failure, but to change the way your students change failure. Um, there's nothing wrong with failing. And I draw, like when I you can change obstacle into opportunities. When I do a drawing I don't like, that's an opportunity for me to look at it and to see how I can improve from it. And the day I won't do bad drawings anymore, I'm probably going to stop drawing and do something else because there's going to be no, no uh, improvement. No in points, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so as you're saying this, you know, yesterday I asked, John Hardesty, uh, say it takes you 80 years before you actually paint a good painting. So, you know, for the first 80 years of your life, you're painting and you're drawing constantly. You're trying constantly, yet all your paintings stink until finally one time when you're 80, you paint the most awesome painting in the world that the world will remember for centuries is it worth it to you to still be an artist? And he was saying, well, yes, because he doesn't paint them for um, the end result. He paints them for the learning and the process that he loves. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's amazing. I'm sure that is probably the same answer that we all have. But I'm going to switch the question a little bit to you in this way where say you are an artist for 80 years right and uh, you paint a painting in your 20s your early 20s that is the masterpiece the magnus opus the the painting that everybody will remember you from forever and ever for 80 years of your life and uh, afterwards all your paintings are failures for the rest <laughs> of your life then is it worth it to you? Would you still be an artist? You asking me? Yes, I'm, at, I'm asking you. You know <laughs> what? Like, it's the process, like John was saying. And yeah, I would, I would still draw and paint and try to, try to do another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? Um... I don't think I, I I don't think I would continue being an artist. But I know that sounds really weird, you know, but and I'll tell you why. It's because it's important to try super hard and it's important to push your limits and all that stuff, right? Uh but we also have to think logically and uh if you're going towards something that isn't going to pan out with all the effort in the world, then I would choose to do something else. You know, uh, you, that, oh, sorry. You know what? I think that nothing in the world can take the place of persistence and determination. Well, that, that was the asterisk that I was going to put in there because as well, I feel like if you are trying hard and especially if you did an awesome painting in your twenties, as long as you keep trying hard, you keep using common sense, it would be impossible for you to not paint another great painting. <laughs> However, that sounds like a curse. 
right? Would would you actually reach the same level as that painting that would be forever and ever remembered? Like, uh, you know, the Michael Jackson album that that he could never top, or mm -hmm. Harry Potter, right? There's no, or not no way, but it's very highly unlikely that J.K. Rowling's is going to write something as successful as Harry Potter ever again. Mm -hmm. I think all these people that do all these amazing things, you got to enjoy the process to be as passionate about what you do. Yes, and before everybody goes, oh, Bobby would quit painting if he wasn't good at it. Uh, <laughs> that's only if all the other paintings absolutely stunk forever and ever and it would never ever be good which is a fictional you know this would never happen um but if i was able to still paint pretty darn good paintings they just never reached the pinnacle of this super viral super famous painting that will last forever and ever then yes i would continue to be an artist sorry i didn't want to make that too long uh, but i did <laughs> so let's go on to the next question because there's a ton um bobby yes may i ask you something of course my friend yes you know spud web yes that the, he's the one little, of the, the short basketball player that rocked the world won the nba dunk off competition way way back yes yeah he's five foot seven and he's an nba player Yes. And he won the Duncan contest, the contest in 86. Mm. So for sure, because of him, I know that nothing in the world can take the place of persistence and determination. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. actually, the question I asked you is almost like, you know, what, what would you do if you could fly? Because it never could happen. <laughs> yeah, um, it's true. All right, awesome. Let's go on to the next question here, which is, uh, do you still use sketchbooks? How many per year? Any preferred size? Any favorite pencil brands or types, etc.? Uh, do I use sketchbooks? Yes, I still use sketchbooks. How many sketchbooks a year? I don't know because half the time, you know, I finish like a half of it and then I get another sketchbook and that one's different, so I want to sketch in that one. and. So it's a big mess. It's not really that organized. How about you, T? I use sketchbook, but they're a mess. I write in it. I take notes on it. I sketch in it. It's like some are lined. Some they're everywhere. Sometimes I find a sketchbook I didn't see in like months. So it's all over. It again. I'm sorry? And then you start sketching in it? In, in yeah, it again. I've sketched you cannot track my sketchbook at a, a clear timeline there's stuff in all of them yeah that's yeah, something that... that i need to i'm, I'm still a... struggling to figure out how to organize my art, art. you know yeah. like especially files, files. you know computer yeah. files because you know you yeah. have your high res version that's flattened right. you have your are working files where it's like work in progress and then you have your low res for web like how do you how do you organize your stuff is it organized uh, i'm not the most organized person but usually i have a folder with the name of the company i'm working on if i work for more than one project for them i got a folder with the name of the project and i i number my files so i write zero zero one um cover you know what i mean yeah yeah and then uh this way the next one i save would be zero zero or it could be zero zero one cover one then cover two blah 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 so as i save there's always a higher number so i can i know what i save in what order mm -hmm. but yeah i do that yeah i don't, I don't like think i don't know of okay well the search continues uh let's go on to the next question there's here. no perfect way and but uh, we miss a part of the last question about the favorite pencil oh yes yes pencils my favorite pencil is the palomino black wing oh uh, yes which I, I have in my hand right now as i'm talking to you i have one in my hand as yeah. well because you just <laughs> said it and i picked it up i don't use this but I use a uh, Coley Race black pencil 
That's, yeah. You know, it's it's less smudgy. That's why. Yeah, I, I like that one too. And uh, do you use the black and blue, uh, the red and blue one? I don't. That one is very much K's uh, weapon of choice, it seems. So it's the Coley race that is half red, half blue. Yes. There you go for the pencils. Um, let's go on to the next question here. This one is from Flavio, one of our good buddies that came through <laughs> the workshop house. Any plans on doing an extension program for former workshop students? If so, sign me up. Uh, <laughs> we went over this one. Right on, Flavio. Miss you, buddy. Let's go on to the next one. So the next one says, I'm doing a fun pack test for a studio. What methods do you use to match the style? Light box. Do it over a light box so that everything matches really nicely and then do the sketch over so that it's nice and loose, you know, nice and natural. It isn't as stiff and uh, nice kind of back and forth with that it really helps. Um, there's a bunch of other questions, but did you, did you want to add anything to that? Anybody, anybody? Nope. Nope. Right on. Okay, let's go on to the next question here. Uh, so Mark asks, I just finished reading Alla Prima. Wonderful. What a great book. Uh, and then it says, of a show? Question mark. Don't understand that question, but big ups to <laughs> Mark. I like uh, Alla Prima as well. Richard Schmidt. Great book. Great I, book, yeah. Yeah, you wrote, you read it as well. Yes. Um, next question here. Riley Phillips asks, I'm busy with wife and family and second kid coming this week. Wow. Damn, Riley. Riley. I didn't know that. Excellent. You remember Riley? He was at Sheridan. Riley, Riley Phillips? Phillips? Yeah. Oh, snap. oh, snap. Was he in your year or? No, he was uh, one of my... I think I was his tutor at the beginning, and then I was his teacher when I was teaching there. You taught him as well. He had his cousin. They were always together. Trevor oh, and Riley. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right I on. didn't know he had kids now. <laughs> Congratulations. Congrats, Riley. Right on. Um, yeah. So good to see all these familiar faces. Okay, so... Are there any great effective study techniques for people short on time? Now, you and I, we don't have kids, but we know a lot of people that do have kids and how do they work? So first, Nathan Fawkes, he has a detached uh, studio in his house. So it's not directly connected to his house. And, he, you know, him and I were talking just yesterday about how, how much of a difference that really, really is. Um, of course, not everybody can have a swanky, cool studio like that. Uh, so a friend of mine, she has four, three kids. I always think it's like more and more every year, <laughs> you know, like, uh, Jody and Perry, they have three kids and Jody wakes up at around four o'clock every morning, something like that. Sometimes three thirty or something like I thought I was hardcore. Uh, waking up at four thirty, five o'clock, she's hardcore. Um, then there's also Steven Silver. And Steven, he has a whole routine, you know. And I think the real key with all of these people is that they don't waste time. And something that I can relate to there, uh, something to help you, Riley, is uh, it sounds completely counterintuitive, but meditation is so good for this so you meditate you try to blank out your mind for the first 10 minutes or so or however long you can go five minutes or or more uh and then the next 10 minutes five or 10 minutes what you what i do is i picture the day and i picture the tasks that i that i want to do and i picture going from one task to the other and i really try to picture this clear as day kind of um, from my kind of like from my own um, point of view right like looking out my eyeballs I'm not looking at myself walk around um, and really try and picture it as, as realistic as possible right finishing one task not going to my Facebook not going to anything moving on to the next task uh, that's really really great and the other thing was that um, when you do your to-do list, 
I generally do my to-do list around four o'clock. Three or four o'clock is perfect for me because I still have lots of energy. Um, I'm not in a rush to leave yet because it's still the afternoon. And uh, generally by this time, I would have had a lot done. Uh, if you try to do your to-do list in the morning, you waste so much more time just sitting there and thinking, like, what should I do next? What should I do next? Uh, and it's really all about squeezing out all those useless little minutes that you're just messing around doing nothing productive. And uh, that's how you get those extra minutes up. For me, anyways. Anything you want to... Anybody um, want to add to that? Me, more specifically... Um... One thing I make my students do is 30 minute studies. I feel what you get from a 30 minute studies is great. And if you spend more than 30 minutes, you get a tiny little bit more for a lot of time you put in. So I find your investment is the best when you put 30 minutes. I'd rather do four, t four 30 minute study than a two hour study. I feel I get four times as much this way. So it's quick. It just take half an hour. And if you would just have one a day, you would do one 30 minute study a day of a different texture, a different fruit, a different thing. Then by the end of the year, you would know how to paint 365 different texture <laughs> for only 30 minutes. Uh, yeah. Like how do you, how do you eat an elephant tea? You know this one? It's one yeah, bite, one at, a bite at a time. All right. So, uh... <laughs> and everyone can put 30 minutes on their art every day. Yes, yes. Uh, and the other thing, Riley, is that um, I try to leave decision-making thinking towards like after my lunch, right? So in the very morning, it's all about just knocking off one task after the other, very kind of just like Terminator style, what's next, what's next, what's next, what's my next objective. Um, that helps a lot, I'm telling you a lot. All right, so let's go to the next question here because there's tons. Um, Katie Jackson asks, uh, which course is best for learning about bringing story to characters? This is my the next on my list. And then Ian's new course, Ian McKegg, which he's talking about. One of my artistic heroes, uh, his new course, which sounds awesome. So story. Story-wise, there's three I would recommend. First one is uh, Chris Pern. Story artist and director Chris Pern teaches storyboarding, but even more than that, it's a course about storytelling, right? And this is from a person that tells stories for a living. Uh, currently working on a new Han Solo movie um, due out in a long time, but uh, he knows what he's doing and his course is phenomenal. That is going to really teach you about the core principles of storytelling right which are essential then the next one is uh sam nielsen has a wonderful course about uh color and light directed towards concept art for story you know the title kind of s explains it all by itself this one is great for storytelling in the painting aspect of things and then there is alex wu luis gonzalez uh, gesture drawing class which is phenomenal phenomenal the title also kind of self like explains why it's so good for story because they teach you the uh, they teach you how to learn and develop the whole act of um, posing acting which is like one of the huge things that everybody seems to most people seem to have trouble with um, then I guess the last one that I want to mention is the one that uh, Massey was talking about earlier character design with Daniel Ariega his whole entire class is heavily on story story and acting so let's go on to the next question because there's a whole bunch of questions um, next question says 
This one's from Nacho. What's up, Nacho? Nacho says, uh, great to catch another stream. Are you familiar with the internships in the studios like Pixar or DreamWorks? That sounds like a good way to learn. Heck yeah. Especially the Pixar one, you know, I, I, I feel really good things about it. Um, there's a lot of people that I've known that have gone through that program that, you know, Pixar ended up keeping. You know, it gives them a really great way to have low risk of getting to know you and know who you are and the personality and, and your work habits. And, uh, yeah, it's a great way for people kind of beginning their careers, um, you know, to, to get the training. Um, interrupt me at any time, T. I'm just going to keep going to the next question here. Okay. So the next question is from Mark. Uh, and he says, how do you balance art? art learning or art jobs with other hobbies without feeling guilty schedule it in my friend once you're done it doesn't mean that you have to keep going you know if you have a list of the things that you want to finish by the end of the day and it's a reasonable list when you finish that list go and do whatever else you want to do you know i learn stuff as well actually in the mornings um i've been I started uh, from recommendations off the internet. I started this thing called the Wim Hof method. <laughs> I know T likes this idea, but it, yeah. Wim Hof teaches you how to control like your all sorts of stuff. But the main thing is to learn and expand your control of your mind and, and your body through uh, cold. It's taking really, really cold showers now, T. Jeez. <laughs> um, I guess let's go on to the next question here. Unless you guys have anything to add. But uh, the next question is Allison asks Okay, I'm taking introduction to digital painting, plus I work a full-time job, and I have two kids. Only time I have is after they go to bed. Uh, how do I stay creative when I fall, when I want to fall asleep? That's why I wake up early, so I don't have that problem. You know, uh, kind of like a selfish kind of thing to say is, why give the best hours of your day to your job? I know that sounds funny. <laughs> You know, and, and Masse, who works for me at the studio, I'm saying this in front of her as well. Uh, but, hey, I totally agree because it's like this. If you spend the best, day, best hours of your day doing things that are going to expand your mind, expand your skill set, and, it, you know, overall improvement, that's going to be great for your studio as well in the long run. Right? So my own uh suggestion is to wake up earlier it's a great great uh suggestion um okay let's go on to the next one because i definitely want to get to everybody's questions uh next one comes from marks everywhere again so how do you keep an open energy if you're a natural introvert okay so how do you kind of exude this this personality, this energy that makes you very friendly and open? Um, I, I'm sure I, I want to hear what T-Bear is going to say about this. Uh, but for me, one thing is look at yourself in the mirror and see what your smile looks like you know see what you as much as you can record what you say and things like that and watch yourself as disturbing as that will be because it will be disturbing <laughs> pretty much i hate listening to myself or watching myself uh but it's important you know and then you catch things like 
I was doing this interview on Sidebar like years and years and years ago where every other word was absolutely. And it totally irked me so much that I try never to say absolutely again. <laughs> what about you, T? I know you, you got some good uh, tips on this one. How to be more of an extrovert, you know, how to give more of an extroverted kind of sense to your personality. Hmm. Um, you know, I used to be the shyest person ever when I was young. When I was in elementary school, I used to just stand alone in the yard. <laughs> and the worst, <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing for me ever was oral presentations and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And I think I started be being less shy when I started working in a wine store because I had to talk to people. And I think uh, the trick is to be passionate about something. Um, I started talking to people because I was selling wine and I love wine and I studied wine and I was passionate about it. And I just love talking about it. And it's not kind of a task for me to talk about it. And I also start teaching art because I was helping people at school because I was talking about something that I love. So um, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question right, but I would, you know, if you're an artist, I'm going to assume, um, hang out with artists, you know, and you guys talk about art. And I find it's not hard to talk about stuff when you're passionate about something, even though I used to be the shyest person. Now I can talk to like anyone and you know, just right now we're talking in the interview. I didn't know too much how to prepare for this, but it's like, it's fun. We're just talking about cool stuff that we like, and I don't feel like nervous every time I talk. And when I get, uh, every month I get a guest to come at the Imaginism workshop, and sometimes we shoot videos and stuff, and I don't over prepare for that. It's just, bunch of artists together talking about art and we just have amazing discussion so i feel a good way to um be more extroverted and talk more to people is to uh hang out with people that have the similar passion to you and then it just natural yeah and you know like visualize how you are through the other person's eyes constantly visualize how you are from different perspectives mm -hmm. you know, that's gonna not only help you become uh you, you know more of a sociable likable person because you know it'll help it'll save you from annoying people a lot more and all sorts of other things embarrassing yourself and <laughs> you know if you're constantly thinking about how am i seeming right now am i seeming like an idiot you know um I do that constantly and, and the other benefit, the huge other benefit of this is that it really helps your compassion, mm -hmm. right? Because you're constantly thinking about stuff from another person's point of view and, and it helps with your empathy. So nothing but good things from practicing that. Um, next question here is Toby asks, uh, Toby Art asks, uh, hearing T's voice throws me back to the Sketchaholic days. Right on. I think Bobby <laughs> had mentioned maybe starting up something like that again. Any updates on that? Uh, no new updates on that. But yes, I definitely will do that again in the future, except evolved slightly different and a thousand times even cooler. Uh, look out because it's definitely on my radar to get back on that eventually. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And if you do that, Bobby, count me in for sure. Right on. The best way to keep up to date is sign up for the newsletter. Yeah, that way you'll be able to find out everything that we're doing because schoolism, imaginism, we're always doing so many things now. Uh, Actually, if you don't mind, I'll just mention a couple of things to uh, like yeah. Montreal. We're coming to Montreal, coming to your neck of the woods, T. Yes. Uh, March 
12th, 13th, that's going to be with Daniel Ariega, character designer and art director at Pixar. Chris Pern, who I just talked about, story and uh, story artist director. L Luis Gonzalez, uh, Pixar story artist and teaches the gesture drawing. Luke DeMarchelier, who is this brilliant uh, artist, formerly of DreamWorks, killer stuff, as well as one of the all-time you know greats in our industry Nathan Faux is going to be teaching something uh, awesome as well as Steven Silver then it's Florence we go to Florence March 19th it's going to be with Helen Mingju Chen Ryan Lang and myself then Seattle uh, April 7th and 8th Marcelo Vignali Dice Tsumi, Robert Kondo Terrell Whitlatch Mike Yamada and myself so tons of stuff and then also just went on sale this week London April 16th 17th Berlin April 23rd 24th highly 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 recommended and if you are one of that one top one percent that truly loves pain and working hard and <laughs> just killing it crazy intensity because there are some people when when I start a class and it's new students, they will come up to me and be like, be extra hard on me. I want the pain. <laughs> you know, I want to get destroyed. And if you are one of those people and you are hungry, then I would have to. I got to uh, mention the in-house workshop. If you, if you get in, there's only four artists that get accepted at one time. Thierry LaFontaine himself will come and pick your butt up at the airport, bring you to the house with 30 days nonstop, eat, breathe, sleep, art every day, all day. It is the most intense, yet in the most serene place possible. In the wonderful uh, Imaginism House, Lake House. Uh, there you go. And a free thing that I want to recommend to everybody perfect bait my audio book the perfect bait I put it for free for a month and a half it's free to download until January 31st um, we'll put a link in the YouTube video for that as well uh, and then the last thing is Nathan Faux. he's gonna be doing the chew stream with me he's gonna be painting awesome super excited about that um, yeah, first, is there anything else that you want to mention, T? Um, <clears throat> just maybe that the, right now we're taking application for the Imaginism workshop. The workshop is April 17 to May 16. So if you're up to the challenge and you want to be part of the Imaginism crew and live the experience of how we used to all live together and became Imaginism Studios. We're recreating this experience for you. So really hard, really challenging, but more fun than it's hard, even though it's really hard. Yeah, and even though we're saying it's really hard... Eh, it's like, rewarding. Yes, and, and even though we're saying it's really hard, everybody gets through it. Because yeah. there's only four of you, so nobody gets left behind. Yeah, no matter if you're a beginner or an expert, there's someone that just applied that works at Pixar. Right on. Right on. And, you know, like, there, people come from literally all over the world, you know, from Pixar, from wherever, from South Africa, even one time from Nunavut, the yeah. Inuit country, <laughs> you know, in the Arctic. Is it actually part of the Arctic? I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know what it. I would think it's Canada, but I'm not sure. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, this is all the time that we have today. I know we went uh, quite a bit over time. So thank you so much, T. Can't wait to hang out in a couple weeks because we're yeah. going to come down and uh, visit you guys and stay at the house too. Thanks to you, Bobby. And, um, yeah, I'm going to see you soon, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun when you come here. I love it. I love the workshop house. Dog sledding. That's all I got to say. Yeah, we're going to go snowmobile and dog sledding.
Right on. Okay, so thanks everybody. The wow moment is probably when you know you, you start and you meet everyone for the first time. The ability to connect with each other. When I came here to the worship, it was like a huge step for me. Like, okay, I'm getting my drive back. And there was a little period where I I found myself like what I couldn't draw the way I used to, and I was a little lost. And then after the second week, there was a day when everything clicked, and all the things that they were telling me kind of like made sense and in a minute I understood the whole thing and that was pretty like a role moment like okay now I get it now I can I can get all the stuff that they're you know teaching me and I can apply it to what I've been doing for the last year. T is a very persistent teacher he's very honest and I think that's what makes us grow because he's not afraid of showing what what we're doing wrong and what we can do to improve he's not trying to make us happy, he's trying to make us learn, so that makes all the difference for me. T has a very clear way of explaining things. When he gives us our feedback, it's just like, you kind of you think that you've done an okay job, and then he just takes it to like a whole different level. That's just the main crazy thing, because now I can take well on the Cintiq from three weeks ago, I couldn't. I, I evolved so much since I came here. It's like a boot camp where I got all the tools I need, I think that that's the most incredible thing and we've been working like this for the whole month and I feel that I improved a lot. And so that was one of the reasons I really wanted to do the workshop. Be surrounded by art, be surrounded by other students. After this workshop and meeting other artists, you really get to open your mind to the different perspectives and the different minds and how big the world actually is. You know, someone's from Spain, someone's from Austria, Brazil and then people in Canada. It's just crazy. This. This was the best experience I've had in education. It's like I went to college and I had to do a lot of classes that I wasn't interested in. I would do the things I was and then it's diluted in between different subjects. And, but this one, you live, you live the course, you wake up, you're in class, you're, the level of immersion is so intense that there is no way that you won't take, you, you won't learn a whole lot. It was extremely rewarding. It's definitely life-changing. I would definitely recommend this uh, workshop to anyone. I haven't been to any other school or class or anything like that where the teachers have this level. This is, this is industry level. This is something that you don't get in any normal school in any way. So the fact that you are living with them and they're teaching you stuff day by day and they can comment on what you do, it's a big privilege, it's a big thing. It's not, you know, you don't, you don't take it for granted. It's really amazing, I really suggest it. I'm the first Colombian here, <laughs> so I'm gonna just spread the word because it's really worth it. I love an experience. <laughs> Every artist should go through such an experience, learn a uh, meeting people and getting to know other techniques and going deep into art for like a whole month. It's, it's awesome. 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 Awesome.